Right, so tonight, if you have your Bibles, I want you to get your Bibles, hold on to them, grab a hold of them, and let's honor the Lord tonight. I'm going to get down on my knees before the Lord, and tonight, would you stand to your feet if you have the ability, and let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, tonight we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, with expectant hearts, we look to you. Not to a man, not to a woman, not to the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, the educated or the uneducated, God. Not to the rich or to the poor. Not to the tall, the short, the wide, the thin, God. We look to you. God, we acknowledge that it's your Holy Spirit who is the teacher of the church. Build faith big on the inside of us. Give us a bigger picture who you are, what you're capable of, God. God, increase our capacity to understand your ability and your wisdom and your ways. Tonight, we don't want to just have church as usual. God, we want to have a God encounter where we walk away never to be the same. Father, we praise you and thank you that you are the miracle working God, and we declare you to be so tonight, God. We pray that tonight that you would release faith, that you would release the miraculous in this place, that you would heal sick bodies, bind that which is broken, Deliver those who are bound and oppressed in the name of Jesus. And Father, we praise you and thank you, Lord, that you will bring light into darkness, God. Life to death, Lord. Salvation where there was damnation, God. We thank you, Lord, that you deliver, that you heal and you restore, God. You do the miraculous amongst us tonight. And Father, we ask for our brothers and sisters in the Lord that are preaching and hearing the gospel tonight. That, Lord, it would be no less supernatural amongst them as it is amongst us. God, that you would speak your word, that you would heal, that you would deliver, that you would save. And, Father, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement and we say, Amen. 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 Tonight, open your Bibles up with me to the book of Matthew, the 13th chapter, and find the very last set of verses in Matthew, the 15th chapter. Matthew, chapter 13, sorry, 13, verse 54 through number 58. Jesus has been traveling, he's been ministering. In fact, Matthew chapter number 13 starts out with many of the parables of Jesus. Very familiar verses, very famous verses. Verses that we often teach. And he starts to travel, and at the end of Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse number 54, it says, when he had come to his own country, everybody say his own country. Remember, Jesus was a Nazarene. And that was where he grew up, that's where he lived, was in Nazareth. And so here he comes back to Nazareth. He came to his own country. It says, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Now, if we would have stopped right there, that would be a great verse, wouldn't it? He went home and everybody was amazed. But as we read on, we find out that that's not really what was going on. It goes on and it says this in verse 55. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called... Mary, and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Verse 56, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? They start scratching their heads and they start asking a question. See, their astonishment was not in respect. It wasn't in amazement. It was more of a haughty look, of a proud look. Wait a second, where did he Get all these. Things. Isn't this the carpenter's son? They start looking down their noses at this common laborer. Isn't his mother called Mary? Don't we know his mama's name? And Mary, that's a pretty common name, isn't it? Aren't his brothers hanging out with us? Isn't that them sitting over there? They're part of Stand and Lean Incorporated, standing on a corner, leaning on a wall, right? We know those guys. And his sisters, they're, they're, they're amongst us. They're hanging out. So what makes him any different than the rest of us? And they're indignant. Now take a look at what it continues on. It says, verse 57, so they were offended at him. They literally took offense. Even though Jesus was teaching them and Jesus was doing the miraculous in the surrounding countries and they had heard about the miracles that had taken place. Jesus comes and he teaches in their synagogue. He starts to minister to them and all of a sudden, they're offended at him. So Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now, remember, I had you all say his own country. See, he had gone home. And so here Jesus, knowing that he is the prophet who is to come, knowing that he is the one who is prophesied of, he is the anointed one of God, he is the Messiah, the Christ, 
the son of the living God. Here he is among them in his own country where he had grown up and they were offended at him when he comes to them. Verse number 58, probably one of the saddest verses in the entire Bible. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Mark's gospel tells us that he he did a couple of miracles. Laid his hand on a couple of sick people and healed them. But he didn't do a lot. That it wasn't flowing like it had in other places. That the crowds weren't coming out and everybody getting healed like we had seen in other parts of the Bible. There, There wasn't demons screaming and coming out of people as he taught and as he ministered like we see in other parts of the Bible. He could only do a couple of things, only work a couple of miracles. And look at what he was limited by, by their unbelief. In other words, the mighty works that we see is really speaking of miracles. The, the original word is dunamis. It's, it's the word that we get our same word for dynamite. It's an explosive power. Literally the miracle working power of God. That when you work a miracle, you are working the supernatural power of God. Jesus Born of a virgin, born into human flesh, brought into this creation, though he was God, the book of Philippians said he did not consider robbery to be equal with God, and yet he emptied himself of all of his glory, of all of his privilege, and he broke from the Father's side and became flesh and dwelt among us. He lived in an earth suit, in a human body like you and like me, that he had to eat, he had to rest, he had times where he wept he had emotions and so Jesus as he operated he operated in the anointing of God the spirit of God we see when he was baptized came upon him it descended on him like a dove and he was anointed with the Holy Spirit without measure and so Jesus in the flesh was working the supernatural power of God on the earth and he did the miraculous But in this instance, it says that he could not do the miracle because of their unbelief. Now, the word unbelief, again, is an interesting word. In the Bible, you'll find that there is faith and there is unbelief. The word faith is the word pistis, okay? The word unbelief is ah, pistis. Now, that ah means a negative. It means it's different. It it means it's opposed to, it's anti, if you will. It's the same thing in the English when we say belief Versus unbelief. I want you to notice that one little letter in the Greek and two little letters in the English is what turns something from faith and belief in the positive to unbelief in the negative. In other words, one little thing can get in the way of our faith and stop our miracle. Are you listening tonight? It doesn't take a lot. Just one little thing can get in the way of your miracle. You would say, well, let's get rid of that little thing. If it's small, then let me get rid of it. Well, let me give you this picture, okay? I, 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 I had this bowl here with this cup, and the bowl was really just because I'm about ready to spill water all over the place. You see this cup? Okay, there's a nice stainless steel mug, insulated, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can put coffee in there. Keeps hot things hot and cold things cold, right? And, uh, and so if you put this lid on this here, there's a little opening. Okay, everybody sees the opening? All right, now let's say this is you. You are a vessel, right? And that God has supernatural power, okay? That's this water that I'm holding here in my hand. If we open this up, right? If I wanted to get this water into that vessel, I would know that there's a little teeny tiny opening on the top that I could pour it into. But I want you to also notice on the top of this cup, there's a little switch right here, just a little thing. And if I push that, what happens? It closes, right? Right? One little thing can get in the way of your miracle. Notice the power's not going in. In fact, it's staying right there in the lid if you can see that. None of it is getting into this cup. Why? Because one little thing got in the way. But the moment you open, the moment you get rid of that one little thing, look at what happens. I start to pour it in, and what takes place? Now all of a sudden, the power can get into the cup. Now, all of a sudden, we can receive what God wants to do in our life. No longer are we blocked by that little thing, but now we're open to what God wants to do in our lives. So what is that one little thing? Well, we see it there in Matthew chapter 13. 
That one little thing was an offense. It started with familiarity. It started with familiarity. See, sometimes in church, it's easy to get familiar. Even in our relationship with God. You know, we can have healthy habits, and, and I'm a person who promotes healthy habits. You know, I'm, I'm the type of guy that I, I would encourage you to wake up in the morning, to get into the Word, to pray, to create that healthy habit. I'm the type of guy that would say, at your lunch break, make sure that you pray, make sure that you, if you have some time, open up the Bible, maybe chop it up with some friends and talk about Jesus. You know, I, I'm the type of guy that would say, before you go to bed, make sure the last thing on your mind, before you let your head hit the pillow, may that last thing on your mind be your king and your God, your love, Jesus Christ, and get into the word before bed. See, there are routines that we can put in our life that are healthy for us, that will build us and that will encourage us. But the problem is, is that oftentimes we let our routines become just that, routine. And it no longer is a living relationship with Jesus Christ, but now it's just a religious experience to check something off of a list. And we get familiar with God. Jesus all of a sudden becomes our homie, like we've seen the t-shirt, right? Jesus is my homie. It's almost like Jesus is just hanging out. He's the wingman in the car. He's the dude in the back just kind of smiling, and he's cool with everything. Listen, Jesus is a king. Jesus is God Almighty, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. He is no common man. And yes, he is the friend who sticks closer than a brother, but he is to be revered. He is to be respected. He is the Lord Almighty. He is the Ancient of Days. He is the Holy One of Israel. And you do not approach a king like he's your homie. You come to the king with reverence and respect and awe. Why? Because he's the king. But you're welcomed in with his love and his embrace as a friend and as a brother, as the bridegroom. But you approach with respect. You do not let him get familiar. See, Jesus, when he came to his own country, they said, don't we know this guy? Hadn't he been hanging out with him in, in his whole family here? It was familiar for them. And because it was familiar, they said, well, it's just Jesus. Many times when we come to church, I believe that God has encounters. God has miracles. You don't have to have a miracle night to get a miracle in church. Let me say that again. You don't have to have a miracle night to get a miracle in church. In fact, you don't even have to have a building. You can get a miracle at home. You can get a miracle in a small group gathering. You can get a miracle wherever you and Jesus are because you take him everywhere you go. Philip was instructed on a road out there in the desert to go down and to minister to somebody. And there on the road, he ministered Jesus he baptized a guy, and then bang, he zapped out of there, beam me up, Jesus, and all of a sudden he appears in another spot, and he's running off, ministering, and telling someone else about Jesus. See, miracles can happen anywhere. But if we get familiar, then we'll look right past what God wants to do in our lives. Hey, what's well, another little thing that can, can get in the way? How about this one? Prejudice. Prejudice can get in the way of our miracle. Look at what they said. Isn't this the carpenter's son? He's not educated. He didn't go to the rabbinical school. Whose feet did he sit at before he started to teach? Where did he get these words? How did he do these miracles? See, there was a prejudice against Jesus. You'll find not only the people of his own country, but the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Remember, can anything good come out of Nazareth? They deride him. They laugh at him. And their prejudice. You know, in our nation right now, pretty hot topic, isn't it? What can that guy do? He's old. He's white. He's crazy, right? But if we believe God, King's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He can turn it like a water course wherever he desires. He's a vessel that God put in there to you. Well, what about that woman over there? She's black. She's uneducated. What's she going to do? Listen, she's a vessel of God. God can do great and mighty things through anybody. Well, what about that guy? He's undocumented. He's illegal. He's a Mexican. Came over the border. What, what's God going to do in their life? Well, listen, God's not finished with anyone yet. And you, you don't tell the end from the beginning. God tells the end from the beginning. We've got to get prejudice out of our heart so that we can allow the flow of God's power into our lives. But as long as we're prejudiced, what about that young guy up there on the stage? He's wearing two shirts. They don't even, they're not even the same color. What's that all about? 
too young. He didn't have an MDiv. He didn't have a doctor. The only doctor is because his name is Dan Roth. That's his initials, right? <laughs> Listen, guys. God can use the rocks to cry out. He can raise up children from Abraham out of the stones. He can use a, a jackass to rebuke a prophet. My goodness. God can use the young and the dumb and the old and the wise and the gray and the weak and the frail. God can use anybody. Anybody he chooses, anybody who's believing. What's another small thing? Well, offense. We would consider an offense anything that annoys us or is perceived as insulting or a violation of our standards. We set ourselves up as judge, jury, and executioner. We get offended when some, what are they doing? Why is that church growing? What's that all about? Well, well, why did they get that? I didn't get that. I've been serving the Lord, right? We start to take offense. Somebody gets a miracle and we didn't get one. Listen, tonight, someone might get a miracle you wanted and you get passed up. It's okay. God's still God. And it doesn't mean no. It may just mean not now. We don't know what God's up to oftentimes. But don't be looking over the fence at what someone else has and get offended because someone else is getting joy. You know, sometimes you know something about us and you saw somebody on Facebook Saturday night, they were out partying, Ugh, what are they doing? And then you see them in church and they're crying and repenting. You're like, yeah, you sucker, you better be repenting. And we get offended, right? Why? Because we've judged them. We, we've let our gavel come down and now cut them off, Lord. We take offense. But you know what the Bible, the biblical definition of offense is? You know the little, okay, picture this for a second. Remember when you were a kid and you wanted to trap a rabbit or a squirrel or something like that? What did you do? You went and got a box. You got a stick and you got a rope, right? You tied that little string around the stick. You set the box up on its side like that, right? And you propped it up and then you took the little string out and then you put some food underneath the box so that if the squirrel or the rabbit or whatever it is, the bird, whatever you were trying to catch came over there, you saw it go in that little box and then what did you do? You yanked that stick out, right? The box comes down and you have your bird. You have your squirrel. You have your rabbit, okay? The word for offense in the New Testament is that little stick. It's the trigger that shuts the trap. That's why John Bevere wrote a book called The Bait of Satan talking about offenses. Offenses are the little trigger that Satan uses in our life to trap us, to get the little door shut so that the flow stops. The power of God ceases. And as long as we deal in offenses, the trap is shut. But if we choose to forgive, if we choose to overlook an offense, if we choose to lay down our judgment and take up God's judgment and say, well, God's not finished with them yet, and thank God they're in church today lifting their hands to the Lord, and Lord, may I have a heart of repentance if I'm ever in that situation, and God bless them, and rather than be like the Pharisee, I'm glad that I'm not like that sinful tax collector, rather than that, we'd be like the tax collector beating our chest and saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. If we have that attitude, now all of a sudden, we are open to the flow of what God wants to do in our lives. So if these are the anti-faith, if these are the opposite, if this is what closes these little things that get in the way, then to open our faith so that God can fill us, then we need the opposite of these things. Can I tell you what the opposite of these things is? It's the fear of the Lord. It's the fear of the Lord. Fear simply means this, a healthy awe, respect, and reverence for the Lord. Let me show it to you in the word in the book of Proverbs, chapter 8, verse number 13. Proverbs, turn there with me. Chapter 8. Verse number 13. Look at what it says in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. That is a declaration that is being made by someone named Wisdom in the book of Proverbs. So Wisdom is teaching us something. See, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And therefore, it defines for us, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. To operate in offense is contrary to the ways of God. It is evil. To operate in prejudice is evil. To operate in, 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 in these lies or, or in pride or any of these things 
is evil. To operate in familiarity with the Lord is contrary to what God wants for us. Therefore, it is evil. We have to shake ourselves and get out of this rut. And we have to fear the Lord. We have to walk in awe and respect for all who he is. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. Remember they started to speak against Jesus. They started to say, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't, and, and what does the Bible say? When words are many, sin is not absent. And therefore we need to understand, listen, if you're believing God for a miracle, it's time to operate in the fear of the Lord. That as you respect, as you honor, as you reverence in all, all who God is, as you're not too familiar with him. He's my friend, he's my brother, but he's my king, he's my Lord and my savior, and he deserves my undying devotion and respect. As you look at, at the messengers God wants to use and the avenues God is bringing, God, you can bring it however you want to bring it because you are sovereign, and God, I will not look down on others, but I will raise others up in my opinion and in my thinking. And finally, as you don't operate in offenses, you don't get in the trap of the enemy. But as you walk in the freedom that God has for you, now the miracles can flow. Tonight, I want to pray for people in this place for miracles. The first miracle I want to pray for is the miracle of salvation. See, you cannot have the mighty work of salvation without faith. Romans chapter 1, verse number 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. That means it's for everybody. But it takes faith. It takes believing that God is able to save you. See, many times we come into church and we think that just because we came to church, that means we're a Christian. When nothing could be further from the truth. You cannot attend enough church to earn your way into heaven. God doesn't have some sort of a checklist where he's looking at your attendance and, oh, I guess they made it enough times. I'll let them in. Sometimes we think if we can be good enough, that we can go to heaven. And yet nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can be good enough. It doesn't have a grading scale, a line, a curve that you have to be above in order to get into heaven. You cannot be good enough to get to heaven. Can't be good enough to work your way in. Can't have your good outweigh your bad and God says, oh, I guess I'll let him in. It doesn't work like that. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And our goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags, the Bible says. That means they're gonna get thrown out, not gonna get to stay. Sometimes we think if we were raised in church, parents told us we're Christians growing up, born in America, America's a Christian nation. Maybe if you were baptized or christened as a child, wear religious jewelry like a cross or St. Christopher, maybe you have a tattoo that says in him or a t-shirt that says Jesus. Listen, it doesn't matter your upbringing, doesn't matter your jewelry, doesn't matter your t-shirt or your tattoo, doesn't matter if you're baptized or christened as a child or attend religious classes, you're not gonna make it by any of those things. Sometimes people think, well, you know what? I know who God is. I know about Jesus. I celebrate Easter and the resurrection, sing the songs at Christmas every year of my life. And I could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament. I know who God is, and that means I'm gonna go to heaven. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible say that just by knowing who God is, you get to go to heaven? I mean, the demons know who God is. They know who Jesus is. They screamed and they cried out when they saw him. The devil himself knows who Jesus is, came to him and was quoting scripture to Jesus. And yet the devil's not going to heaven. So everybody look up at me here for a second. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head, not about having mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is that gets you that miracle of salvation. But rather this is about your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals. There's been prejudice against it. There's been familiarity with it, and there's been offenses taken at it. Well, listen, no matter what you've heard about being born again is, let's not let the world define it for us. Let's let the Bible do that for us, shall we? What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart, and you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you. In the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to the church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. He says, when I come, I wanna find you hot, or I want to find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, he says, I will vomit you from my mouth. Those are pretty gross, pretty graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what's he saying, lukewarm? What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and again. And occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. 
How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, your call, your choice. In a moment, I'm gonna count to three, just like this. One, two, three, I'm gonna pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to respond to the word that you're hearing right now. You wanna believe God for this miracle of salvation. You wanna receive it tonight. You wanna be born again, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Here's what you gotta do. When you hear my hands pop together, you just simply raise your hand right where you're at. Don't have to stand Nothing like that. Just simply raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You might be thinking, well, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. But listen, Jesus said these words. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, it's your call. It's your choice. You can sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right. Or you can give God all of your heart. You can give God all of your life. And listen, I'm going to make it so simple, so easy on you tonight. I'm going to pray with you right there in your seats. Not going to call you forward, okay? Just going to pray with you right there in your seats. So it's just this simple tonight. Couldn't get any easier. Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever. Tonight, who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Today is your day. Make sure. Tonight, who should raise their hand if you've never done this before, never said yes to Jesus, given him all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart. Little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, this is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Get ready to get your hands up. If you're in any of those categories that I described, you can be born again, giving God all of your heart, all of your life, headed for heaven, denying hell. Tonight is your night for the miracle of salvation. If you're ready to receive that, get ready to get your hand up. I'm gonna count to three and pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. Thank you. There's one. There's two. There's three. Four. Got you right there. Thank you. Five, thank you on this side. Who else? Six over there, got you. Thank you. God bless you. Six wise people already. Seven, got you over there. Thank you. Eight, nine, got you guys. Thank you right there. Ten over here, got you over there. Eleven, back in the family room. I see that hand. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? Anybody else? We've got about 11 wise people. I'm going to pray with you in your seat. Couldn't get any easier tonight. Thank you. Got you right there, number 12. Who else? Anybody else? I'm going to pray with you. Got you. Thank you, number 13. Come on, if that's you, this is your time. This is your moment. Who else? Oh, right there. Thank you, number 14. Number 15, if you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, you should. Come on. Tonight, you can receive the miracle of salvation. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? Thank you, number 15. Thank you, number 16. Got you. God bless you. God bless you. All right, now I'm going to pray with you, okay? Remember, I said I'm going to pray with you in your seat. Now, the miracle is this. The Bible says that before we gave our hearts and lives to Jesus, that we were dead in our transgression and sin. Now what's going to happen is Jesus is going to come on the inside and make you brand new. I don't know how he does that. It's a miracle. It's the supernatural power of God working in your life right now. You're going to get a brand new heart with a brand new start. I don't know how God does that, but tonight you're brand new. You get a clean slate. That old man is gone, dead and in the grave, crucified with Christ. Now there's a new man that's going to be raised up again. You're going to be brand new. Everything changes from the inside out. Yeah, you're going to look the same, smell the same, but you're new. All right? So I'm going to lead you in this prayer, everybody. Let's bow our heads together. Let's close our eyes. And I want you to pray this right after me, especially those who raise their hands, but everybody's going to join in together. Say, Father God, I come to you now in Jesus' name. I give you all of my heart and all of my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me with your blood. Cleanse me of my past. And give me a great future with you. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he came, that he died, and he was raised again to life just for me. Thank you, Jesus. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. And let it be known that from this day on, I am a Christian. I'm saved. I'm headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus.
Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah.